even if it's going to get where I'm not invited back or you're not going to like me anymore. But I hope enough of you know me well enough to know where my heart's at. But that having been said, ladies and gentlemen, as I was preparing for this e event, I felt an overwhelming sense of Satan in my life. Day after day, night after night, nightmare, uh, weird things going on in my body, weird things happening to people around me. I, it was just like this, uh, it, it was just like hell time. And I, I was like, um, you know, God, why does Satan hate them so much? We know why he hates me. See, I get why anybody hates me. I get it. But, you know, why does Satan hate you guys so much? And God said, you know, you're asking the wrong question, Paisley. You're asking the wrong question. I was like, really? Well, you know, you being God and all, you might know better. So what is the right question? And the right question is, is why do these kids love Satan so much? Why are you guys conjuring the devil in my life? Why are you guys bringing me face to face with my adversary? I've done nothing to you. I love you guys. I dress funny. I act funny, but you know what? I really have a heart for God, and God has a heart for you. And I travel really far distance for barely enough to cover the gas, cheapskates. And uh, <laughs> to reach you guys for Jesus, why would you conjure up the devil on my behalf? I mean, you guys, you guys get together and, and draw pentagrams and light candles. I don't want to hug. <laughs> See me later. All right. <laughs> no, I got to act all tough now. You can't, like, make me melt. They can't find out I'm nice. Anyways, interrupting me when I'm telling you guys that you conjure up the devil to make jokes might prove my point to the experts in the room a lot less than, than support that I might be mistaken. Now, I'm going to say this. I was asking you guys, do you guys get together and like make pentagrams or and light candles? You guys sacrifice goats and chickens and little children? No. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. I just had to ask. People ask me that all the time. People ask me if I'm for real or if I'm making fun of Christianity. I'm sorry, I'm talking and I hear your voice coming out. People ask me if I'm making fun of Christianity doing what I'm doing. I've read reviews of, of my performances where they quoted song lyrics that weren't that I never said. That made it sound like I was making fun. So we just gotta get to know each other. Don't get, don't get busy. But my question is this. Why on earth would God accuse you of loving Satan too much? And that's what I spent all the time preparing for tonight praying about. Because I'd be a little ticked off if one of you came to my party <laughs> and said that about me. I'd be upset. I'd, I'd get uncomfortable at least. And I don't mean to be rude, but I'm not going to not deliver the word of the Lord as he gave it to me. I was listening to you guys worship, which, by the way, was really beautiful and, and, and should have been enough for your little souls. But I was listening to words about holiness and and I was like, hi, I, I don't really ever feel very holy. Do these kids ever feel holy? I mean, we don't really live in a very holy place, but we're talking about the Lord being holy. However, he said something about we need to be holy too. But I, I don't want to speak for the other um, leaders here, but I will say for myself, um, that's a weird sensation to feel holy, and it's very few and far between for me personally. And especially when I love when I get accused of being holier than thou. And I go, well, that, that, that may not be much. It may be easy to be holier than thou. But I'm not holy like him. I have too many feelings. I have too many impulses. I have too many instincts. I have my flesh. But I really prayed about this. I really, I really did. I really, I, I just spent time with you guys in the presence of the Lord, just whatever I was doing, you know, driving or, or, or shaving or, you know, whatever I was doing, I was, just, I was just thinking about you with the presence of the Lord. And I really felt like I needed to talk about when, when I was your age, when I was your age. And I think there's nothing more insulting when you're your age to have someone my age tell you what it was like. I get that. 
but I don't care. I don't care because you have not met one person like me in your life, and you won't. You won't. I'm almost older than God, and I've yet to meet someone like me. But God has taken my life and done something truly amazing with it, even if no one else thinks so. I think so. God's taken something so horrible as the death of a dear friend and, and given me a hit song with it. I, it's kind of cool. But he's reached people through my pain and my loss and my suffering and my conjuring up of Satan. God bless me. But when I was somewhere near the age of some of you in the room, I was thrust into rock and roll. I had a friend who became a rock star when, when I was, was 12 years old. And I started writing songs for her band, and I started hanging out with rock stars, and I was catapulted into a world of a never-ending stream of drugs and alcohol and everyone's favorite subject, sex. And I have, you know, a good seven years from 12 to 19 that's pretty much a glorious blur. Like, I remember parts of this, those years, and he said, not mentioning the decade, but I remember parts of that time, but I also remember why I forgot. And I was in so much pain at home, and I was in so much pain at school, but then I could sneak out at night, change my clothes, and go to Hollywood and be a punk rocker, and hang out with some of the coolest people you people have ever heard of, who are my friends and contemporaries, if they're not dead. And that's all we did, was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And preachers come in all the time, and they do this sermon. They weren't me, and they didn't do what I did, and they didn't know who I know, and they weren't around the people that have influenced the world you live in, like I was. But the thing that gets me is that I didn't know better. I didn't know better. You know, there was a time when, when rich people did cocaine. So if you could afford cocaine, you did it much like driving, you know, a fancy car. It was healthy. Drugs were not a threat to mankind when my generation was, was doing them. We didn't experiment. We indulged. We were the children of the excess. We, we, we brought alcohol to school. We popped pills at school, we smoked pot at school, we cut school, went somewhere, bought drugs, did drugs, came back to school stoned or wasted. Um, we throw up on ourselves in science class, they clean us up in the nurse's office, send us back to class, because we all did it, because that was my generation, that's what we did. And more than half my graduating class from high school is dead already, but we won't think about that. We won't think about how many suicides happen in my life, how many drug overdoses happen in my life, how many hundreds of people I've known personally that have died of AIDS. We, won't, we don't have to go there, because we have to worry about the fact that we have a short period of time and this is your soul we're talking about. I'm so tempted not to do an altar call tonight because I don't think they matter. If you go home, and you don't do something different. I don't know if they matter. Altar calls here are always great. A lot of people raise their hands, and that makes the visitor feel very successful. My son called me before I, I came here tonight, and he said, uh, I just want to wish you well in Barstow, and save them all. That's what he said, because he's been here before, and he's seen the reaction in the room. And I realized that broke my heart, because I've seen you all too. I hate for anyone not to be friends with me on Facebook anymore, but you are, a lot of you are, and I read what you write. That's what friends do. I know what your outlook on life is, and I know what you believe, and I know what you say, and I know why you do what you do, and I get it, but I just want to tell you, most people die because of what I'm seeing and what I know to be true. And the thing that scares me most of all is you guys are the children of example. 
See, we didn't have an example. I'm a Jewish guy, and I was never allowed to get near Christians. So I know the first Christian I ever met. I still know her because she led me to Jesus. But I went 19 years not knowing. No one in the room can say that. No one ever told me God loved me. Nobody ever told me that I was born for a specific purpose. I was in a hot L.A. punk band, and we were packing houses and recording a record, and I was doing drugs, and I can't remember how many people I slept with, but I did, and most of them are dead. Most of my friends from that period of my life are dead. This is a miracle I'm not dead. I might be dead. This may be what hell looks like, but I think I'm not dead. And uh, I, you know, there's no judgment for me whatsoever. But I know that I'm blessed, and I know that I was separated for a purpose, and I found out that God loves me. And I, I found out that Jesus died for me, and I found out that I have a really amazing life ahead of me. I, I went from being someone who had cancer in their 20s, who, I had lymphatic cancer in my 20s, and you died from that, by the way, to God healing me and having an amazing ministry and getting married and having three amazing kids that, by the way, survived. They're you. I don't understand why anyone who can spend five minutes in the presence of the Lord does not understand how valuable they are to Him. I don't get it. Everyone I went to high school, this was so funny, I talked to someone about this the other day. We talked about how we found all our old friends from high school on Facebook. And he said, isn't it amazing how our perceptions were all wrong and people were a lot different than we imagined? And I went, speak for yourself, brother. Every single person I knew in high school is exactly how I thought they were. Every single one. The ones that were amazing, giving, loving people grew up to be amazing, giving, loving people. And the ones that were bullies and were cruel are bullies and cruel today. And the ones that indulge in drugs still do drugs. My best friend Stan, growing up, we were in a band together. He protected me from bullies. I loved this guy. We did punk clubs together. We did everything together. We broke every law together and every law of nature, I might add. And in the end, he is still a drug addict who is a DJ in a strip bar. Because the one person who came to him to try to lead him to Jesus failed. Because at that time, who was going to take me serious? Who was ever going to take my testimony serious when two days ago I was doing stuff that I'll never admit to while I'm being videotaped? People don't change. God changes people, but people don't change. And to be honest, God changes people and they usually revert right back. And I'm seeing a lot of that. In your age group, everywhere I go, and I apologize for doing the age thing. I really do. I, I know it's offensive. And trust me, when you're old, like me, it's really embarrassing to do it. You know, I talk to my kids and I say, when I was your age, and that blank thing happens. And I know they're never going to listen to what I'm saying. That's why I beat it into them. See, I could beat it into them, but I can't beat it into you guys. But what I do want to say is, is that if you are in the presence even for five seconds, and you still go back to smoking, drinking, drugs, sleeping around, or my favorite, just being mean, you are an offense to the presence of the Lord. You are saying that the presence of the Lord isn't good enough for your almighty selves. And you're wrong. So you're wrong. See, someone like me, someone who's so dependent on the Lord, I walk in and I feel the presence of the Lord in this room. And I thank God. God is not going to let me fall. God's not going to let me trip down these stairs. I have the things I'm afraid of. And I'm certainly not afraid of you not liking me. I'm not afraid of being bad. I'm not afraid of not being invited back. Those things happen. I don't want to fall. I don't want to fall in front of a room full of people. 
I walk in and the presence of the Lord is in this room, and I'm not going to fall. And if I do, he'll catch me. Watch I fall, that would be great. But, <laughs> but I walked in and, 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 and I mentioned to one person that this wind has just killed me, killed my allergies. And he stopped what he was doing and he just prayed for me on the spot. I heard me sing tonight. I was good. Who cares? I'm a man who knows where the presence of the Lord is and knows what it means when the Lord bothers to visit us at all. But I have an indwelling of the Lord through his Holy Spirit. So when I do something that I'm not supposed to do, and I do things I'm not supposed to do, Please, I may be holier than thou, but that doesn't make me very holy. Remember that. I feel something. I feel something wrong in me. Sometimes I see negative consequences in my life for my actions. Sometimes I get sick because I've wronged the spirit of the Lord in me. And I know to turn to him... And he will hold me and comfort me and forgive me and love me and elevate me back to where he sees me. And that is as amazing and flawless. And I promise you, and forgive the term, when I was your age, I could care less what God thought about me. I just cared about what I thought. And I'm going to tell you something. I had a really high opinion of myself. Notice that hasn't gone away. But I also had a really low opinion of myself. What a horrible thing to be at war on the inside all the time. One minute trying to act like you're really tough and clever and smart and you know everything and you know where you're going and you know what you're going to get for it. And on the other hand, being on the inside, being terrified, someone's going to find out that you're just a little kid and you're scared and you don't know everything and you have no idea what you're going to do when you get out of high school, when you get out, when you, if you go to college, what you're going to do with your life and what you're going to do if you're going to be faced again with the opportunity to pollute your body with drugs and alcohol and sex. And don't anybody tell me that I'm not even close to the mark here because I read what you guys post on Facebook. You know, they're all going to unfriend me. So I can't spy on them anymore. But you know what? God bless you. That's your solution to what I'm saying is to not let me know. That's the same crap you pull with your parents. Well, I don't want them knowing, so I'll unfriend.